Wandering Willie's Tale. You want to have the Sir Robert Red Gauntlet or Atelk, who lived in these parts before the dear years. The country will long mind him, and our fathers used to draw breath thick if ever they heard him named. He was out with the healing men in Montrose's time, and again he was in the hills with Glen Cairn in the 1652 and see, so when King Charles II came in, Hwa was in sick favour as the laird the Red Gauntlet. He was knighted at London Court with the King's ain sword, and being a red-hot prelatist, he came down here rampodging like a lion with commissions of lieutenancy and of lunacy for what I can, to put down all the Whigs and Covenanters in the country. Wild work they made of, for the Whigs were as dour as the Cavaliers were fierce, and it was which should first tire the other. Red Gauntlet was I for the strong hand, and his name is kenned as wide in the country as Claver Houses or Tom D. Ells. Glen, nor Dargal, nor Mountain, nor Cave could hide the pair hell folk when Red Gauntlet was out, with Bugle and Bloodhound after them as if they had been so many deer. In truth, when they found them, they didn't make muckle more ceremony than a healing man with a roebuck. It was just, will you take the test? If no, make ready, present, fire! And there lay the recusant. Far and wide was Sir Robert hated and feared. Men thought he had a direct compact with Satan, that he was proof against steel, and that bullets harped off his buff coat like hail stains from a hearth, that he had a mare that would turn a hair on the side of Carifragons, and muckle mare to the same purpose of whilk mare anon. The best blessing they weared in him was deal scope with red gauntlet. He wasn't a bad master to his ain folk, though, and was well enough liked by his tenants. And as for the lackeys and troopers that rode out with him to the persecutions, as the Whigs called these killing times, they would have drunken themselves blind to his health at any time. Now ye are to ken that my good sire lived on Red Gauntlet's Grand. They call the place Primrose now. We had lived on the Grand and under the Red Gauntlet since the riding days, and long afore, it was a pleasant bit, and I think the air is callerer and fresher there than anywhere else in the country. It's all deserted now, and I sat in the broken door cheek three days since, and I was glad I couldn't see the plight the place was in. But that's all wide of the merk. There dwelt my good sire, Steeny Steenson, a rambling, rattling chill he had been in his young days, and could play wheel in the pipes. He was famous at Hoopers and Girders, all Cumberland couldn't touch him at Jockey Latin, and he had the finest finger for the back lilt between Berwick and Carlisle. The like of Steenie wasn't the sort they made Whigs, though, and so he became a Tory, as they call it, which we now call Jacobites, just due to a kind of necessity that he might belong to some side or other. He had no ill will to the Whig bodies, and liked not to see the blood run, Though being obliged to follow Sir Robert in hunting and hosting, watching and warding, he saw muckle mischief, and maybe did some that he couldn't avoid. Now Steenie was a kind of favourite with his master, and kenned all the folks about the castle, and was often sent for to play the pipes when they were at their merriment. Old Dougal MacCallum, the butler, that had followed Sir Robert through Giddenhill, thick and thin, pill and stream, was specially fond of the pipes, and I gave my good sire his good word with the laird, for Dougal could turn his master round his finger. We all round come the revolution, and it had liked to have broken the hearts both of Dougal and his master. But the change was no altogether so great as they feared, and other folk thought for. The Whigs made an unca craw in what they would do with their old enemies, and in special with Sir Robert Red Gauntlet, but there were our many great folks dipped in the same doings to make a speck and span new world. So, Parliament passed it all our easy. And Sir Robert, baiting that he was held to hunting foxes instead of Covenanters, remained just the man he was. His revel was as loud and his hall as well lighted as ever it had been. Though maybe he lacked the fines or the non-conformists that used to come to stock larder and cellar, for it certainly began to be keener about the rents than his tenants used to find them before, and they behoved to be prompt to the rent day, or else the laird wasn't pleased. And he was sick and awesome buddy, that nobody cared to anger him, for the oaths he swore, 
and the rage he used to get into, and the looks that he put on made men sometimes think him a devil incarnate. Well, my good sire was nae manager. Not that he was a very great misguider, but he had nae the saving gift, and he got twa terms rent in a rear. He got the first brush at Whitsunday, put hour with fair words and piping, but when Martin must came, there was a summons for the grand officer to come with a rent on a day precise, or else Steenie behoved to flit. Sair work he had to get the cellar, but he was well friended, and at last he got the hail scraped together, a thousand mercs. The maist of it was for a neighbour they called Larry Laprick, a sly toad. Larry had wealth the gear, could hunt with a hound and run with a hare, and be Whig or Tory Santer sinner as the wind stood. He was a professor in this revolution world, but he liked an aura soon, and a tune in the pipes wheel enough at a by time and a ben all. He thought he had good security for the celery lent my good sire o'er the stocking at Primrose now. Away trots my good sire to Red Gauntlet Castle, with a heavy purse and a light heart, glad to be out of the laird's danger. Well, the first thing he learned at the castle was that Sir Robert had fretted himself into a fit of the gout, because he did not appear before twelve o'clock. It was no other gather for the sake of the money, Dougal thought, but because he did not like to part with my good sire off his grand. Dougal was glad to see Steenie, and brought him into the great oak parlour, and there sat the laird his leesom lane, except him that he had beside him a great ill-favoured jack and ape. It was a special pet of his, a conquered beast it was, and many an ill natured trick it played. Ill to please it was, and easily angered. Ran about the hale castle, chattering and yowling and pinching and biting and folk, especially before ill weather or disturbances in the state. Sir Robert called it Major Weir, after the warlock that was burnt and few folk liked either the name or the conditions of the creature. They thought there was something in it by order, and my good sire was no just easy in mind when the door shut on him, and he saw himself in the room with nobody but the laird, Dougal McCallum, and the major, a thing that had no chance to him before. Sir Robert sat, or should I say, there he lay in a great armed chair, with his grand velvet gown, and his feet on a cradle, for he had both gout and gravel, and his face looked as gash and ghastly as Satan's. Major Weir sat opposite to him, in a red-laced coat, and the laird's wig on his head, and I, as Sir Robert, girned with pain, the jack and ape girned too, like a sheep's head between a pair of tongues, an ill for fearsome couple they were. The laird's buff coat was hung on a pin behind him, and his broadsword and his pistols within reach, for he keep it up the old fashion of having his weapons ready and a horse saddled by day and night, just as he used to when he was able to loup on horseback and away after any of the hell folk he could get spearns of. Some said it was for fear of the Whigs taking vengeance, but I judge it was just his old custom. He was nae geen to fear anything. The rental book with its black cover and brass clasps was lying beside him, and a book of skulldaddery songs was put betwixt the leaves to keep it open at the place where it bore evidence against the good man of Primrose now as behind the hand with his mails and duties. Sir Robert gave my good sire a look as if he would have withered his heart in his bosom. You mon ken. He had a way of bend in his brows that men saw the visible mark of a horseshoe in his forehead, deep dented, as if it had been stamped there. Are ye come light handed, ye son of a tomb whistle? said Sir Robert. Zounds, if you are. My good sire, with as good a countenance as he could put on, made a leg and placed the bag of money on the table with a dash, like a man that does something clever. The laird drew it till him hastily. Is it a here, stinny man? Your honour will find it right, said my good sire. Here, Dougal, said the laird. Gie stinny a tass of brandy downstairs till I couldn't the cellar and write the receipt. But they were nae wheel out of the room, when Sir Robert gave a yellach that guard the castle rock. Back ran Dougal, in flew the livery men, 
Yell on yell, gid the laird, ilk in mere off than the other. My good sire knew not whether to stand or flee, but he ventured back into the parlour, where all was gone hurdy-gurdy, nobody to say come in or go out. Terribly the laird roared for cold water to his feet, and whined to cool his throat, and hell, 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 and its flames was either the word in his mouth. They brought him water, and when they plunged his swollen feet into the tub, he cried out it was burning, and folks say that it did bubble and sparkle like a seething cauldron. He flung the cup at Dougal's head and said he had given him blood instead of burgundy. And sure enough, the lass washed cluttered blood off the carpet the next day. The jock and ape the cod major weir it jabbered and cried as if it was mocking its mester. My good sire's head was like to turn. He forgot both cellar and receipt and doon the stairs he banged. But as he ran, the shrieks came faint and fainter. There was a deep drawn shivering groan. <sighs> And word gave through the castle that the laird was dead. Well, away came my grandsire with his finger in his mouth, and his best hope was that Dougal had seen the money bag and heard the laird speak or write in the receipt. The young laird, now Sir John, came from Edinburgh to see things put to rights. Sir John and his father never greed well. He had been bred an advocate, and afterwards sat in the last Scots Parliament and voted for the Union, having gotten it was thought a rug or the compensations. If his feather could have come out of his grave, he would have brained him for it on his own hearthstone. Some thought it was easier coontin' with a rough old knight than the fair-spoken youngin, but mere of that anon. Dougal MacCallum, pair buddy, neither grat nor grained but get about the hoose, looking like a corpse, but directing, as was his duty, or the order of the grand funeral. Now Dougal looked aye war and war when night was coming, and was aye the last to go to his bed, whilk was in a little room just opposite to the chamber of days, whilk his mister occupied while he was living, and where he now lay in state, as they called it, well a day. The night before the funeral, Dougal could keep his ain counsel nae longer. He came doon wi his proud spirit, and fairly asked old Hutchin to sit in his room with him for an hour. When they were in the round, Dougal took a tass of brandy to himself, and gave another to Hutchin, and wished him all health and long life, and said that for himself he was nae long for this world, for that every night since Sir Robert's day. His silver call had sounded from the state chamber, just as it used to at nights in his lifetime, to call Dougal to help to turn him in his bed. Dougal said that being alone with the dead and that flare of the tower, for nobody cared to wake Sir Robert Red Gauntlet like another corpse, he had never dared to answer the call, but that now his conscience checked him for neglecting his duty. For though death breaks service, said MacCallum, it shall never break my service to Sir Robert, and I will answer his next whistle. So be you will stand by me, Hutchin. Hutchin had knee well to the work, but he had stood by Dougal in battle and broil, and he would not fail him at this pinch. So down the carrel sat o'er a stoop of brandy, and Hutchin, who was something of a clerk, would have read a chapter of the Bible, but Dougal would hear nothing but a blood o' Davy Lindsay, whilk was the war preparation. When midnight came, and the house was as quiet as a grave, sure enough, the silver whistle sounded as sharp and shrill as if Sir Robert was blowing it, and up got the twa old serving men, and tottered into the room where the dead man lay. Hutchin saw enough at the first glance, for there were torches in the room, which showed him the foul fiend in his ain shape, sitting in the laird's coffin. How he couped as if he had been dead. He couldn't tell how long he lay in a trance at the door, but when he gathered himself, he cried on his neighbour, and getting nae answer, he raised the hoose, when Dougal was found lying dead within twa steps of the bed where his mister's coffin was placed. As for the whistle, it was gone, yin's and I, 
but many a time it was heard in the top of the house and the bartizan, and among the old chimneys and turrets were the hoolets of their nests. Sir John hushed the matter up, and the funeral passed over without mere bogle work. But when all was over, and the laird was beginning to settle his affairs, every tenant was called upon for his arrears, and my good sire for the full sum that stood against him in the rental book. Will away trots to the castle to tell his story, and there he is introduced to Sir John, sitting in his father's chair in deep mourning with weepers and hanging cravat, and a small walking rapier by his side, instead of the old broadsword that had a hundred worth of steel about it, what with blade, chape, and basket hilt. I have heard their communion so often tell thou that I almost think I was there myself, though I couldn't be born at the time. In fact, Alan, my companion, mimicked with a good deal of humour the flattering, conciliating tone of the tenant's address and the hypocritical melancholy of the laird's reply. His grandfather, he said, had, while he spoke, his eye fixed in the rental book, as if it were a mastiff dog that he was afraid would spring up and bite him. I wish ye joy, sir, o' the heed seat and the white loaf and the braid lairdship. Your feather was a kind man to friends and followers, muckle grace to you, Sir John, to fill his shoon. His boots, I should say, for he seldom wore shoon, unless it were mules when he had the gout. <laughs> Ay, Steenie, quoth the laird, sighing deeply and putting his napkin to his in. His was a sudden call, and he will be missed in the country. <laughs> no time to set his house in order. We'll prepare Godward, no doubt, which is the root of the matter, but left us behind a tangled hesp to wind, Steenie. <clears throat> we man go to business, Steenie. Much to do and little time to do it in. Here he opened the fatal volume. I have heard of a thing they call the Doomsday Book. I'm clear it has been a rental of back gun and tenants. Stephen said Sir John, still in the same soft, sleek tone of voice. Stephen Stevenson, or Steenson, you are down here for a year's rent behind the hand, due at last term. Uh, please, Your Honour, Sir John, I paid it to your father. You took a receipt then, doubtless, Stephen, and can produce it. Indeed, I had no time, please, Your Honour, for no sooner had I said to the cellar, and just as his honour, Sir Robert, that's game, drew it, tell him to count it, and write out the receipt, he was ta'en with the pains that removed him. That was unlucky, said Sir John after a pause. But ye may be paid it in the presence of somebody. I want but a talus qualis evidence, Stephen. I would go our strictly to work with no poor man. Troth, Sir John, there was nobody in the room but Dougal McCallum, the butler, but as your honour kens, he has in followed his old mister. Very unlucky again, Stephen, said Sir John, without altering his voice a single note. The man to whom you paid the money is dead, and the man who witnessed the payment is dead too, and the seller, which should have been here to the fore, is neither seen nor heard tell of in the repositories. How am I to believe all this? I didn't ken, Your Honour, but there is a bit memorandum note to the very coins, and the folks that lent them to me, for, good help me, I had to borrow out the twenty purses, and I'm sure that ilk man there said doon will take his great oath for what purpose I borrowed the money. I have little doubt you borrowed the money, Steenie. It is the payment that I want to have some proof of. The cellar man be about the house, Sir John, and, and since your honour never got it, and his honour that was, can he had taken it with him, maybe some of the family have seen it. We will examine the servant, Stephen, that is, but reasonable. But lackey and lass and page and groom all denied stoutly they had ever seen such a bag of money as my sire described. What was war? He had unluckily no mention to any living soul in him his purpose of paying his rent. Ye Queen had noticed something under his arm, but she took it for the pipes. Sir John Redgauntlet ordered the servants out of the room, and then said to my good sire, Now, Steenie, 
you see you have fair play, and as I have little doubt ye ken better where to find the cellar than any other body, I beg in fair terms, and for your own sake, that you will end this fashery for Stephen Human pay, or flit. The Lord forgive your opinion, said Stephen, driven almost to his wit's end. I am an honest man. So am I, Stephen, said his honour, and so are all the folks in this house, I hope. But if there be a knave amongst us, it must be he that tells the story he cannot prove. He paused, and then added, more sternly, If I understand your trick, sir, you want to take advantage of some malicious reports concerning things in this family, and particularly respecting my father's sudden death, thereby to cheat me out of this money, and perhaps take away my character by insinuating that I have received the rent I am demanding. Where do you suppose this money to be? I insist upon knowing. My good sire saw everything look so muckle against him that he grew nearly desperate. However, he shifted from one foot to the other, looked at every corner of the room, and made no answer. Speak out, sirrah, said the laird, assuming a look of his father, a very particular yin which he had when he was angry. It seemed as if the wrinkles of his frown made that self-same fearsome shape of a horse's shoe in the midst of his brow. Speak out, sir! I will know your thoughts. Do you suppose that I have this money? Far be it for me to say so, said Stephen. Do you charge any of my people with having taken it? I would be loath to charge them that may be innocent, said my good sire, and if there be any in that is guilty, I have no proof. Somewhere the money must be, if there is a word of truth in your story, said Sir John. I ask where you think it is, and demand a correct answer. In hell, if you will have my thoughts on it, said my good sire, driven to extremity. In hell, with your feather and his silver vessel. Down the stairs he ran, for the parlour was no place for him after such a word, and he heard the laird swearing blood and wounds behind him, as fast as ever did Sir Robert, and roaring for the bailey and the barren officer. Away rode my good sire to his chief creditor, him they called Larry Laprick, to try if he could make anything new to him, but when he told his story he got but the worst word in his way. Thief, beggar, and diver were the softest terms, and to the boot of these hard terms, Laurie brought up the old story o' his dip in his hand in the blood of God's saints, just as if a tenant could have helped riding with a laird, and that a laird likes a Robert Red Gauntlet. My good sire was by this time far beyond the bounds of patience, and while he and Laurie were at deal speed the liars, he was one chancy enough to abuse his doctrine as well as the man, and said things that guard folk's flesh grew that heard them. He wasn't just himself, and he had lived with a wild set in his day. At last they parted, and my good sire was to ride home through the wood of Pitmarkey, that is all foo of black firs, as they say, I ken the wood, but the firs may be black or white, for what I can tell. At the entry of the wood there is a wild common, and on the edge of the common, a little lonely change house that was keep it then by an ostler wife, they see the coda to be far, and there Pierre Steenie cried for a much kin of brandy, for he had had nae refreshment the whole day. Tibby was earnest wi' him to tuck a bite of meat, but he couldnae think o't, nor would he take his foot out of the stirrup, and took off the brandy wholly at twa draughts, and named a toast at each. The first was the memory of Sir Robert Red Gauntlet, and might he never lie quiet in his grave till he had righted his pair bond tenant. And the second was a health to man's enemy, if he would but get him back the pocket cellar, or tell him what came out, for he saw the whole world was like to regard him as a thief and a cheat, and he took that word than even the ruin o' his hoose and hauled. On he rode, little cairn where, it was a dark night turned, and the trees made it yet darker, and he let the beast tuck its ain road through the wood. When all of a sudden, from tired and wearied that it was before, the neg began to spring and flee and start that my good sire could hardly keep the saddle. Upon the whilk, a horseman suddenly riding up beside him said, That's a metal beast of yours, friend. Will you sell him? So saying, he touched the horse's neck with his riding wand, and it fell into its old high hole with a stumbling trot. But his spunk soon would him, I think, continued the stranger. And that is like many a man's courage, that thinks he would do great things till he come to the proof. 
my good sire scarce listen to the spurdy's horse we get in to you, friend, and we the trotted on. But it's like the stranger was yin that disney lightly yield his point, for ride as Steenie liked, he was aye beside him at the self same pace. At last my good sire Steenie Steenson grew half angry, and to say the truth, half feared. What is it that you want with me, friend? he said. If you be a robber, I've nae money, and if you be a leal man wanting company, I've nae hurt for mirth or speaking, and if you want to ken the road, I scarce ken it myself. If you will tell me your grief, said the stranger, I am one that, though I have been sair miscarred in the world, am the only hand for helping my friends. So, my good sire, to ease his ain hurt more than for the money hope of help, told him the story from beginning to end. It's a hard pinch, said the stranger, but I think I can help you. If you could lend the money, sir, and take a long day, I can neither help on earth, said my grandsire. But there may be some under the earth, said the stranger. Come, I'll be frank with you. I could lend you the money on bond, but you would maybe scruple my terms. Now, I can tell you that your old laird is disturbed in his grave by your curses and the wailing of your family, and if ye dar venture to go to see him, he will give you the receipt. My good sire's hair stood on end at this proposal, but he thought his companion might be some humoursome chill that was trying to frighten him and might end with lending him the money. Besides, he was bald with brandy and desperate with distress, and he said he had courage to go to the gate of hell and a step further for that receipt. The stranger laughed. <laughs> well, they rode on through the thickest of the wood, when all of a sudden the horse stopped at the door of a great house, and, but that he knew the place was ten miles off, my good sire would have thought he was at Red Gauntlet Castle. They rode into the outer courtyard, through the muckle folding yets, and beneath the old portcullis. And the whole front of the house was lighted, and there were pipes and fiddles, and as much dancing and array within as used to be in Sir Robert's house at Pace and Yule and such high seasons. They lap off. My good sire, as seemed to him, fastened his horse to the very ring he had tied him to that morning when he gave the weight on the young Sir John. God, said my good sire, if Sir Robert's death be but a dream, he knocked at the hall door, just as he wont, and his old acquaintance, Dougal MacCallum, just after his wont too, came to open the door, and said, Piper Steenie, are you there, lad? Sir Robert has been crying for you. My good sire was like a man in a dream, he looked for the stranger, but he was gain for the time. At last he just tried to say, Ha! Dougal drive hour! Are you living? I thought you had been dead. Never fash yourself wi' me, said Dougal, but look to yourself, and see ye take nothing for anybody here, neither meat, drink, or cellar, except just the receipt that is your own. So saying, he led the way out through halls and trances that were real ken to my good sire, and into the old oak parlour. And there was as much singing of profane songs and birling of red wine and speaking blasphemy and skullduddery as had ever been in Red Gauntlet Castle when it was at the blithest. But Lord, take us in keeping. What a set of ghastly revellers they were that sat round that table! My good sire kind money that had long before gained to their place. There was a fierce Middleton, and the dissolute Rothis, and the crafty Lauderdale, and D.L. with his bald head, and a beard to his girdle, and Earl's Hall with Cameron's blood in his hand, and the wild Bunshaw that had tied blessed Cargill's limbs till the blood sprung, and Dumbarton Douglas, the twice-turned traitor both the country and king. There was a bloody advocate Mackenzie, we for his worldly wit and wisdom had been to the rest as a god. And there was Claverhouse, as beautiful as when he lived, with his long, dark, curled locks streaming down to his laced buff coat, and his left hand always on his right spule blade, 
to hide the wound that the silver bullet had made. He sat apart from them all, and looked at them with a melancholy, haughty countenance, while the rest hallooed and sung and laughed that the room rang. But their smiles were fearfully contorted from time to time, and their laughter passed into such wild sounds as made my good sire's very nails grow blue and chilled the marrow in his veins. They that waited at the table were just the wicked serving men and troopers that had done their work in wicked bidden on earth. There was a long lad of the Nethertoon that helped to take Argyle, and the bishop's summoner that they called the deal's rattle bag, and the wicked guardsmen in their laced coats, and the savage highland Amorites that shed blood like water, and many a proud serving man, haughty o' heart and bloody o' hand, cringing to the wretch and making them wickeder than they would be, grinding the poor to powder when the wretch had broken them to fragments. And many, many mere were coming and ganging, all as busy in their vocation as if they had been alive. Sir Robert Red Gauntlet, in the midst of all this fearful riot, cried with a voice like thunder on Stinny Piper to come to the board he'd where he was sitting, his legs stretched out before him and swathed up with flannel, with his holster pistols aside him, and the great broadsword rested against his chair, just as my good sire had seen him the last time upon earth. The very cushion for the jackanape was close to him, but the creature itself was not there. It was near its hour, it's likely. For he heard them say as he came forward, Is not the major come yet? And another answered, The jackanape will be here by times the morn. And when my good sire came forward, Sir Robert, or his ghost, or the devil in his likeness, said, Will Piper, he is settled with my son for the year's rent. With much ado, my good sire got breath to say that Sir John would not settle without his honour's receipt. "'Ye shall hear that for a tune of the pipes, Dinny,' said the appearance of Sir Robert. "'Play us up, wheel huddled lucky!' Now this was a tune my good sire learned from a warlock that had heard it played when they were worshipping Satan at their meetings, and my good sire had sometimes played it at the ranton suppers in Red Gauntlet Castle, but never very willingly, and now he grew called at the very name of it, and said, for excuse, he had me his pipes with him. "'Macallum, you limmer Beelzebub, said the fearful Sir Robert. "'Bring Steenie the pipes that I'm keeping for him.' Macallum brought a pair of pipes me to serve the piper of Donald of the Isles. But he gave my good sire a nudge as he offered them, and looking secretly and closely, Steenie saw that the chanter was a steel and heated to a white heat, so he had fair warning not to trust his fingers with it. So he excused himself again and said he was faint and frightened and had not wind enough to fill the bag. Then ye man both eat and drink, Stinny, said the figure, for we do little else here, and it's ill speaking between a foo man and a fastin. Now these were the very words that the bloody Earl of Douglas said to keep the king's messenger in hand while he cut the heed off McClellan the Bombay at the Threve Castle. And that put Steenie mair and mair in his guard. So he spoke up like a man and said he came neither to eat nor drink or make minstrelsy, but simply for his ain, to ken what was come of the money he had paid and to get a discharge for it. And he was so stout hearty by this time that he charged Sir Robert for conscience sake he had no power to say the holy name, and as he hoped for peace and rest, to spread no snares for him, but just to give him his ain. The appearance gnashed its teeth and laughed, <laughs> but it took from a large pocket book the receipt and handed it to Steenie. There's your receipt, you pitiful cur! And for the money, my dog whelpo a son may go and look for it in the cat's cradle. My good sire uttered many thanks, and was about to retire when Sir Robert roared aloud, Stop, though, thou sack Dublin son of a whore! I am not done with thee. Here we do nothing for nothing, and you must return on this very day, a twelve month, to pay me, your master, the homage that you owe me for my protection. My feather's tongue was loose to a suddenty, and he said aloud, I refer myself to God's pleasure and not to yours. 
He had no sooner uttered the word than all was dark around him, and he sunk on the earth with such a sudden shock that he lost both breath and sense. How long Steenie lay there he could not tell. But when he came to himself, he was lying in the old kirkyard of Red Gauntlet parishing, just at the door of the family aisle, and the scutcheon of the old knight Sir Robert hanging over his head. There was a deep morning fog and grass and gravestone around him, and his horse was feeding quietly beside the minister's twa cows. Steenie would have thought the whole was a dream, but he had the receipt in his hand, fairly written and signed by the old laird, only the last letters of his name were a little disorderly, written like one seized with sudden pain. Sorely troubled in his mind, he left that dreary place, rode through the mist to Red Gauntlet Castle, and with much ado he got speech of the laird. "'Well, you diver bankrupt!' was the first word. "'Have you brought me my rent?' "'No,' answered my good sire. I have not, but I have brought, your honour, Sir Robert's receipt for it. How, sir? Sir Robert's receipt? You told me he had not given you one. Will your honour please to see if that bit line is right? Sir John looked at every line, at every letter, with much attention, and at last at the date which my good sire had not observed. From my appointed place, he read, this 25th of November. What? That is yesterday. Villain! Thou must have gone to hell for this. I got it from your honour's father. Whether he be in heaven or hell, I know not, said Steenie. I will delate you for a warlock to the Privy Council said Sir John. I will send you to your master, the devil, with the help of a tar-barrel and a torch. I intend to delate myself to the presbytery, said Steenie, and tell them all I have seen last night, whilk are things fitter for them to judge of than a borrowed man like me. Sir John paused, composed himself, and desired to hear the full history, and my grandsire told it from point to point, as I have told it to you, Word for word, neither more nor less. Sir John was silent again for a long time, and at last he said very composedly, Steenie, this story of yours concerns the honour of many a noble family besides mine, and if it be a leasing-making to keep yourself out of my danger, the least you can expect is to have a red-hot iron driven through your tongue and that will be as bad as scudding your fingers with a red-hot chanter. But yet it, it may be true, Steenie, uh, and if the money cast up, I will not know what to think of it. But where shall we find the cat's cradle? There are cats enow about the old house, but I think the kitten without the ceremony of a bed or cradle. We were best ask Hutchin, said my good sire, he kens all the odd corners about, as well as another old serving man that is now gain and that I wouldn't like to name. Ah, well. Hutchin, when he was asked, told him that a ruinous turret long disused next to the clock house, only accessible by a ladder, for the opening was on the outside and far above the battlements, was called, of old, the cat's cradle. There will I go immediately, said Sir John and he took, with what purpose heaven kens, one of his father's pistols from the hall table where they had lain since the night he died, and hastened to the battlements. It was a dangerous place to climb, for the ladder was old and frail and wanted yin or twa runes. However, up got Sir John, and entered at the narrow door, where his body stopped the only little light that was in the bit turret. Something flees at him with a vengeance, Miss dung him back hour. Bang! Gid a knight's pistol, and Hutchin that held the ladder, and my good sire that stood beside him, hears a loud skelloch. A minute after, Sir John flings the body of the jackanape down to them, and cries that the cellar is found, and that they should come up and help him. And there was a bag of cellar, sure enough, and many other things besides that had been missing for many a day. And Sir John, 
when he had right to turret wheel, led my good sire into the dining parlour and took him by the hand, and spoke kindly to him, and said he was sorry he should have doubted his word, and that he would hereafter be a good master to him, to make amends. And now, Steenie, said Sir John, although this vision of yours tends on the whole to my father's credit as an honest man, that he should even after his death desire to see justice done to a poor man like you, yet you are sensible that ill-dispositioned men might make bad constructions upon it concerning his soul's health. So I, I think we had better lay the hail dirdum on that ill diddy creature, Major Weir, and say nothing about your dream in the wood of Pitmarkey. You had taken our muckle brandy to be very certain about anything, and Steenie, this receipt, his hand shook while he held it out, it's but a queer kind of document, uh, and we will do best, I think, to put it quietly in the fire. Odd, but for as queer as it is, it's, uh, it's all the voucher I have for my rent, said my good sire, who is afraid it may be of losing the benefit of Sir Robert's discharge. I will bear the contents to your credit in the rental book, and give you a discharge under my own hand, said Sir John and that on the spot. And, Steenie, if you can hold your tongue about this matter, you shall sit from this term downward at an easier rent. Money thanks to your honour, said Steenie, who saw easily in what corner the wind sat. Doubtless I will be comfortable to all your honour's commands, only I would willingly speak with some powerful minister on the subject, for I do not like this sort of summons of appointment for your honour's feather. Do not call the phantom my father, said Sir John, interrupting him. Well, then, the thing that was so like him, said my good sire. He spoke of my coming back to him this time twelve month, and it's a wet on my conscience. I will, then, said Sir John. If you be so much distressed in mind, you may speak to our minister of the parish. He is a douce man, regards the honour of our family, and the mayor that he may look for some patronage from me. With that, my father readily agreed that the receipt should be burnt, and the laird threw it into the chimney with his own hand. Burn it would not for them, though. But away it flew up the lum, with a long train of spurts at its tail and a hissing noise, like a squib. My good sire gave down to the manse, and the minister, when he had heard the story, said it was his real opinion that though my good sire had gone very far in tampering with dangerous matters yet, as he had refused the devil's arrows, for such was the offer of meat and drink, and had refused to do homage by piping at his bidding, he hoped that if he held a circumspect walk hereafter, Satan could take little advantage by what was coming gain. And indeed, my good sire of his own accord long forswore both the pipes and the brandy. It was not even till the year was out, and the fatal day passed, that he would so much as tuck the fiddle, or drink uskivy or tippany. Sir John made up his story about the jack and ape as he liked himself, and some believe till this day there was no more in the matter than the filching nature of the brute. Indeed, you'll no hinder some to three that it was nane of the old enemy that Dougal and my good sire saw in the laird's room, but only that one chancy creature, the major, capering on the coffin, and that, as to the blown in the laird's whistle, that was heard after he was dead, the filthy brute could do that as well as the laird himself, if no better. But heaven kens the truth, folk first came out by the minister's wife, after Sir John and a rain good man were both in the moulds. And then my good sire, who was failed in his limbs, but knowing his judgment or memory, at least didn't he speak of, was obliged to tell the real narrative to his friends for the credit of his good name. He might else have been charged for a warlock. <laughs>